If you enjoy this video, subscribe to Scarf and Goggles and check out our other content. It's March 1927. On Daytona Beach in Florida, in front of a crowd of 30,000, British Speed King Henry Seagrave is attempting to break the world land speed record. His target is Malcolm Campbell's record of 175 miles per hour, set in Britain just six weeks earlier. Beating it will be a tall order. Campbell's car was sophisticated and powerful, and yet it raised the record by barely three miles per hour. However, Seagrave's car, the Sunbeam nicknamed Mystery by the American press, has a radical solution hidden under its scarlet bodywork. As Seagrave blasts down the beach, the 22.4 litre V12 aero engine in front of him roars and spits flame. Behind him, a second identical V12 raises the volume from deafening to earth shattering. Sunbeam claim that between them, the two engines will produce almost 1,000 horsepower, more than double that of Campbell's Bluebird. On that day at Daytona, Henry Seagrave smashed Campbell's record when he drove the Sunbeam to 203 miles per hour. In the years that followed, the car was barely driven again. It became a touring exhibit before it was eventually sold as a non-runner to the National Motor Museum at Bewley in the south of England. Now, almost 100 years after it set the record, the first car to reach 200 miles per hour is being restored back to running condition by the museum's senior engineer Ian Stanfield and the workshop team. In previous episodes we've seen under the skin of the Sunbeam, looked at the engines and transmission, and uncovered some of the car's secrets hidden since 1927. Five months on from my last visit, I've headed back to Bewley to see how work on the Sunbeam is progressing, before Stan shows me what's currently on the bench in the museum's workshop. Here we have the transmission for the car, and that's made up of three parts. You've got the gearbox in the middle, the bevel drive on the back, which doesn't have a, a differential in it, so once the gearbox drives the bevel drive, the output comes straight out to the side of the chassis, where there's a sprocket on the outside of the chassis. That's chain driven to the rear wheels. As you can see on the rear drum there, it's already got a sprocket. So uh, once the power comes out of the gearbox, goes to the rear sprockets, drives the wheels, drives the car along the beach. The front part of the gearbox here is this, is this spur gearbox. So the input from the rear engine goes through there and the, the front engine is coupled through this coupling here. That drives a big gear in there, drives a smaller gear, drives the main engine clutch, which is here, which drives the gearbox, bevel box, rear wheels. The reason it's silver is the fact that most of the castings are porous so they were always painted silver with an aluminium paint to, to, to actually seal the, 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 uh, the gearbox to stop the oils leaking out of it and as we've pressure washed it so many times most of the paints come off of it we've had to repaint it. It's all bright and shiny at the moment but it will tone down with use. All right, what we have here is the actual crankshaft from the 1,000 horsepower Sunbeam, the V12 Matabele engine. So it's one of the exciting parts of the project to actually put the engine back together. So we're starting off with the crankshaft and we're doing some test fitting of the rods on the crankshaft. And then we're going to test fit the crank into the, into the crankcase. We want to make sure everything is turning and nice and free. Uh, before we actually bolt it up for the last time. So there's quite a lot of bits to this crankshaft. It's not just a billet of steel that's bent. There's all sorts of bits that are connected to it. There's balance weights that have to go onto, onto the crankshaft here. There's also all the mud traps, the bungs within the crankshaft that collects all the debris from, from carbon and everything else over the years. We have to clean all of those out. So there's there's all of these, so yeah, I've got one here which is already out. Um, so we're going to take all those out, clean them, 
put them back in and they're a taper fit. So you've got to make sure they fit nice and tightly because that keeps the oil pressure in. If they're not fitting properly, the oil is pouring out of the crank where it shouldn't be. Right, so as I've said, this crankshaft has balance weights on it, which is different to the 350 Sunbeam. The 350 Sunbeam isn't balanced at all, but they would learned a bit by this time. So uh, I'm just about to fit the last of the balance weights to the crankshaft. And this is the balance weight here. I don't know if you want to feel the weight of that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So that's obviously to try and balance the engine and stop any vibration. So, uh, so is that counterbalancing the journal and, and the webs? It's all, all the rotating masses within the engine. That's what, it, what it's doing. Okay. So I'm guessing um, that, that felt like a couple of kilos, something like that? Yeah, I would say so. About a bag of sugar, something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so, like everything on this, it's beautifully machined. So um, it, everything just slides together. Here's the uh, tab washers that I was, I was talking about. So we've got to fit one of those to the bolt. That then can go through the crankshaft. It's a nice tight fit again, so I'll just tap it with a soft hammer. And then I can put the nut on from that side But before I do that, I better put the other tab washer on, did not I? I'm glad I'm not the only one who does that sort of thing. <laughs> not easy to do from that side, is no, it? No, that's right. That's got it. It's got it started there. And then the bottom side of tab washer, there's another bolt, which I've just got to line up. In fact, it looks like it's gone straight in, which is good. Same with this side. So there's one long bolt that goes right through, and there's one long bolt that two goes short right ones through. that go in from either side. That's correct, yeah. And you talked about all sorts of different threads on the sunbeam. Yeah. So what threads are you talking about when you're talking about the, the, the lower part of the engine here? Well, mostly these are BSF. I say mostly, um, Sunbeam did have a habit of using a fine metric thread as well. Um, Whitworth and some of the other peak pieces, uh, but mainly BSF. But we, we're always getting caught out with, yeah. with the finer threads, you know, so we have to check it. I mean, it's not quite BSF, it's not quite metric conventional, so it's a metric fine. If it's not that, it's something that Sunbeam have used themselves. They've produced their own threads at some point, I think. I don't know why, but uh, but Louis Cotillon was French, so uh, he has you know, affinity to metric threads. Yeah, I was going to ask that, because this is 1918, this engine yeah. was built. So it's a it's far too early for the metric system in britain so yeah, really it is so it's cotillon that's that's, that's got right. an influence yeah. there i mean he worked for peugeot before sunbeam and you know a lot of the technology came from from that side of the the channel basically the twin cam arrangements and things peugeot twin cams were were very good engines um And he's brought all that knowledge with him. So, there we are. That's basically the weight on. I will go round properly and check them before I fold any of the tab washers over. Um, but that's that done. So the next bit I want to do is, is the last of the uh, sludge traps. So there's the, the caps for it. It's very similar to a lot of crankshafts of the period. Rolls-Royce used it all the time with these tapered caps. Um, 
So all we need to do is pop that through the through there, put the cap on the other side. That blocks up the oil gallery and that also acts as a sludge trap for all the debris, carbon deposits and everything else that uh, was produced while the engine was running. But you have to make sure that it sits square into the taper to keep the oil pressure within the, within the crankshaft. Because there's quite a lot of oil running through the crankshaft. There's a lot of space, so there's a lot of oil all being pumped around. 40 to 50 psi of oil all through the crankshaft. So that's a, that's a huge volume of oil. So the pumps do a lot of work. And if you've got a leak, the oil will be coming out of everywhere. So and if the oil pressure disappears, that's bad news, you know. So yeah. we don't want that to happen. How do you get two conrods working off a single journal? Well, your options are either you have a master and slave configuration like this, so that when it's going round the crankshaft, the conrods are going up and down the bores. Your other option is what Merlin or Rolls-Royce have used, is to have two skinnier rods that run alongside each other on the same journal. Um, whether Louis Cotillon considered that or not, I don't know. I, I would think that the thinking was that they've got a nice broad bearing surface on the, on the bottom of the comrod, gives you a, a stronger rod assembly. And Napier did a similar thing. They did, did a, um, a broad arrow engine, the Napier line engine, where they had um, a master rod and they had two slave rods running off the same journal so um, space saving again over the length of the engine especially for aircraft engines you don't want a huge engine out in the front so they were trying to make it as compact as possible so you had three rods on that particular engine running off the same journal but some beam decided to keep it with two, which is fine by me. <laughs> okay. It makes and it easier. The, the power stroke on each of these two then, yeah. is, is that equal because the geometry yeah. is similar? Yeah, the, you'd, yeah. you'd think that uh, one stroke would be different to the other because it's running off, off center of the journal. But the way it's calculated, it, in fact, it is the same the strokes on both both cylinders are the same. Um, I wasn't convinced originally, but a very clever man by the name of Alastair Lyle, who worked for Cosworth, drew it out for me and explained to me exactly how it works. Because um, you're thinking it's running, you're thinking of the center of the journal as being your pivot point, but actually it isn't. It's sort of that position there on the rod. It's when it's going up and down the bores, you know, it's, uh, it takes, get, takes a bit getting, getting round, um, getting it in your head, so, but uh, that's the way it works. So it, it, it doesn't look right, but it, but it absolutely but it is, is right. Yeah. Now he has the advantage of experience with yeah. Cosworth, but he also has the advantage of computer simulations and so on and so forth. Yeah. Louis Cotillon didn't have any of that. No, it was all done on a drawing board in, you know, but uh, clever people back in 1918, you know, you look at the materials they used, the, the machining was phenomenal and the, and the, you know, the design was incredible. You know, they were able to come up with some very good ideas. So uh, clever people back then. So this is one of the original uh, pistons out of this engine. Um, the only thing that isn't original is the piston rings because when we took the rings out of these grooves, none of them would come out intact. They were all glued in there so, so tight with the old Castellar had turned to a Loctite type material and, it, and it, we just couldn't get them out. We tried heating them, flexing them, you know, trying to flush the oil out of it and it just would not work. In the end, every one of them broke. So 
we're very lucky in this country. There's a, there are still a few people about that can make decent things. I mean, so there's a chap called Clupit Ring Company up in Barrow in Furness. He made the rings for us. Um, sent him a sent my pat pattern again, measured it all up, and we've got a complete set of rings for both engines. So with a couple of spares. So there's been no no machining or, or adjustments been needed to those. Not They've to literally these, just not been to these pistons. They are um, exactly the same as as uh, they were when they were fitted in the factory. And as we've said before, these engines haven't done a lot of work. It did go swimming in Detroit, but uh, um, other than that, it's done no work at all, apart from when it went up and down Daytona Beach. So they're almost brand new. This is the front of the engine, um, depending on which way it is in the car or an aeroplane. Um, this would be the front of an aeroplane. So on the end of here, you'll see this, this flange here and this bearing here. This is non-standard to the aircraft. This has been adapted for the car. So this whole lump on the end of the crankshaft is specifically to mount the flywheel on. And then that then goes on to the drive shaft, which then goes on to the gearbox, onto the spur gear, etc. So this is, is non-aircraft related. So that's been machined, fitted, put onto the end of the crankshaft, then the flywheel, and this flywheel doesn't look very big, but it's incredibly heavy. And you need the flywheel for when, when the engine's running so it'll tick over, otherwise uh, um, it'll just, it's either running flat out or it's stopped. I mean, when it's in an aircraft, you've got all that inertia from the propeller acting like a flywheel. Um, so that helps keep it running at low revs. But this, you'd think it's just a lump of steel, but I don't know what it is, but it's incredibly heavy for the size. Um, again, we've got no information of what it is, but you know, you can just about pick it up. It's very, very heavy. So that would be uh, different to the aeroplane. So normally on the end of the aeroplane, you have this coming out here and you'd have a gear on the end of it, which then drives another gear a reduction gear it's called which then comes out and then the propeller goes on the end of there so it just reduces the speed of the propeller because um, if you have it going too fast then the tips of the propellers are going far too fast and you can damage the propeller um, a classic aeroplane the harvard at the moment you can hear uh, as a very distinctive noise from the propeller and that's because the tips of the propeller is supersonic, where it's spinning around so fast on that diameter. So to reduce that, they have a reduction gear, comes out the front of the engine, and we've still got all that on the crankcase. The gears aren't there, but all the housing and the original bearing is all, all in there still. So, uh, but it's just blanked off. Out the bottom of the engine comes this bit, which then goes onto the flywheel, then onto the gearbox. Since my visit to Bewley last October, Stan and the team have begun reassembling the engine block. In the next part, we'll take a look at how things have progressed during the winter. Don't forget, you can keep up to date with the progress of the Sunbeam and make a donation to the restoration campaign by visiting the National Motor Museum's website. Thanks as ever to Stan and the team at Bewley for their help in making this video.